Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, Director of Peer Programs at Jewish Funders Network. And on behalf of JFN, I'm happy to welcome you to today's webinar, which is the first in his new series hosted by the National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty on the key success factors in addressing Jewish poverty. In this series, we will highlight specific case studies and bright spots from throughout North America with a particular focus on meeting the enormous challenges posed by the COVID pandemic and the, and the economic effects. Future sessions will explore such issues as me measurement and evaluation, advocacy, awareness building, virtual program delivery, convening for impact, and engaging people with lived experiences. So please save the following dates, all Thursdays from 12 to 1 p.m., just Eastern time, just like now, for the next four sessions, or January 21st, February 4th, February 18th, and March 4th. Please look at our website and look out for our newsletter for more information and the registration links. So about exciting for today to start us off on this new series. So we have wonderful presenters. And in this session, we will learn about the unique, ch unique challenges and opportunities of providing services in small, less urban Jewish communities. And now I'm happy to hand it over to our moderator, Susan Ditkoff of the Bridge Band Group Boston, who will frame the conversation and introduce today's speakers. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Tamar, and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Susan Wolf Ditkoff. It's my pleasure to moderate this panel today. Um, I just wanted to start by acknowledging that as we sit here on January 7th, um, the events of yesterday, not only in the Georgia senatorial election, but also the violent insurrection at the US Capitol building. Um, it really is a, an historic time. Um, and I just want to give a moment to acknowledge that there are many different reactions and experiences of yesterday, um, probably on this panel, certainly in our audience and certainly in the country and around the world. So uh, for now, I, I think today we're gonna focus on something that to my mind is all the more important as I thought about it, um, the work of building community, living in community, focusing on eliminating poverty, as a community for everyone in our community. Um, this, I couldn't think of a better way to sort of honor the important work that has to be done um, to, to make sure that we stay together as, as a community. We, we acknowledge all of the individuals um, and their, their role in our community um, as, as full members, as full, um, and, and having, having the ability to live their full lives um, with, uh, with both freedom and autonomy and dignity um, and, and security. So I'm very, very excited uh, for this conversation with those, with those caveats. Um, we've got three terrific uh, speakers today. Let me introduce the three of them and then I will turn it over to them uh, to start the conversation on what does it look like to focus on eliminating poverty in a post-COVID era specifically, but just in general, um, in, in our smaller Jewish communities around the country. So we have Rabbi Rachel Isaacs, who's the director of the Center of Small Town Jewish Life at Colby College, also the spiritual leader of Beth Israel Congregation in Waterville, Maine. We have Rabbi Erica Ash, the uh, rabbi of Temple Beth El in Augusta, Maine. Um, and uh, Leslie uh, Dan Rosenthal, the chair of the National Advisory Committee for the Jewish Federations of North America's um, network of independent communities. Um, and Erica, we know some congratulations are in order to you, so we'll uh, potentially talk about that a little bit as well. Uh, but let me turn it over to uh, the three of you, uh, our speakers for today, and uh, to get the conversation started. So hello everybody and welcome. It's such an honor to address a national audience from my small synagogue in Waterville, Maine and to be joined by my wonderful colleagues, Rabbi Erica Ash and Leslie Dannon Rosenthal, who've been doing this holy work with me for quite a few years um, and comprise an incredible team of Jews who have their eyes on communities that are often overlooked or misunderstood. So the goal of uh, the three of us in the time that we have together is to provide a, a moment where communities like ours are in the spotlight to understand what poverty looks like in small town Jewish communities, how collective and regional poverty affects Jewish life and our engagement with the national Jewish community. Um, also how the Center for Small Town Jewish Life in Maine is addressing some of these particularities and last but not least, spanning out to understand communities like Waterville and Augusta in a national context uh, as part of the larger network of independent communities 
uh, through Jewish federations of North America. So Rabbi Ash and I are going to begin, and I just wanna start off by explaining a little bit about Waterville, Maine and, and Augusta, which is very similar as is Lewiston and Auburn, also part of our community, which is that poverty exists and it is a major feature of Jewish life in small towns and post-industrial Jewish communities in places like central Maine and nationally. The town uh, of Waterville, Maine, uh, often understood as a place where Jewish campers from Boston and New York go for lunchtime meals or, or uh, come to Colby College, is also a post-industrial town where 90% of children are on federal um, assisted lunch, get free and reduced lunch from the federal government, 90%. When I came to begin working in Waterville, Maine, it was 80%. So that number has increased. And uh, this is not a, a footnote in our work, but it is actually a major feature of our work. And our kids and our families are reliant upon synagogues and rabbis for rent, for heat, for car repairs, for really making ends meet and, and making life work. That said, poverty in our communities doesn't look the way that it's often imagined, nor are the ways in which we address the poverty in our communities really analogous to the way in which large city communities deal with poverty in their midst. So uh, Erica, would you be willing to talk a little bit more about that? Um, hi, everyone. It is a pleasure to be with you. I am just about 30 minutes down the road from Rabbi Isaacs in Augusta. And um, I just want to talk a little bit about a few kind of instances of, of giving that I've been able to do through my discretionary fund to kind of highlight the fact that in addition to, to basic needs that we think about, uh, heating assistance, especially in Maine in the winter, um, car repairs, things like that, um, there's also people who are cash poor, but not necessarily food poor, say. A lot of our families, um, are, have their own gardens and are, uh, are growing things. And that is really a big source of food for them over the winter. And I'll share the story of uh, one group of people that actually have uh, bees and they have honey. And um, as I was talking to them, I thought, oh, this would be so great. We could get some honey for the congregation for, for uh, Rosh Hashanah to kind of say thank you to all of our volunteers. And it turned out through the course of this discussion that this family was worrying about how they were going to pay their Hebrew school tuition. So I was able to purchase the honey from my discretionary fund, use that money to pay their Hebrew school tuition, and give honey to the congregation. So again, a family that would have, would have, they would have scraped by and they would have found a way to pay the tuition for sure, but they had this uh, amazing honey that we could uh, find a way for, for them to, to use that to help. Um, similarly, we have a lot of people who are medical poor, um, right? Healthcare we know is a huge issue and they might have their basic healthcare covered, but um, their health insurance doesn't cover, for instance, going to their chiro chiropractor for maintenance. So they have to wait until they're ex in extreme pain until they can go to the doctor. So that's something that I can help with. I can say, I can get you that initial consultation, right? Or through the discretionary fund, or I can get you that maintenance care that you need that your health insurance isn't gonna, gonna pay for. So things that we might not necessarily think about, but, but that are really, um, not only helping people meet their basic needs, but really improving their quality of, of life in an important way. Um, and, and I, like Rabbi Isaacs, and then I'll throw it back to you, um, help both Jewish and non-Jewish people in the community. Um, there's a lot of need in the Jewish community. There's a lot of need outside of the Jewish community. And especially at the end of the month, when we see money is getting tight with groceries or rent, um, that is a time when people tend to come to us. So just to follow up on that, we help the entire community through our discretionary accounts. You know, we spend between the two of us a median of probably between five and eight thousand dollars a year, making sure that the needs of our community are met. Now, in addition to the needs that exist in my community, the synagogue, even though numerically smaller than some of the other churches in the area, uh, my discretionary account is larger for all sorts of reasons. So when people or organizations have run out of cash um, in Waterville, 
I am often the one who gets the phone call and, and I'm prepared for that. Um, it's an interesting role for a Jewish community to play. Uh, but when a hotel room needs to be rented for a family that's just been evicted, I'm often the one that is called to fill that need. Also, not that it should be a major focus when women need help with reproductive choice issues. Uh, as a liberal Jewish rabbi, I'm often the only source of support for Jewish and non-Jewish women to whom they can turn. Um, I also wanna bring up the fact, and I think that this is really important for Jewish families around the country to understand, for some of the poorer families in my community, parents with advanced degrees for one reason or another that have fallen into financial trouble can't afford to pay the application fees for their kids to apply for college. And so in the past year, I, play, I paid for two different families for their children to pay for their um, SATs and for um, college applications. Um, all of those students ended up receiving full scholarships to college, but had we not had the money to pay their application fees, they couldn't have even gotten to the point of knowing uh, that they were accepted and got that funding uh, to move forward. And a lot of times these families fall in that in-between space where they don't qualify for programs like Questbridge or Posse, but don't have the money to pay for food, medicine, rent, heat, and college applications and our discretionary account really comes in there. And, you know, I want, I'm going to pass it over to Erica finally on this point to talk a little bit about the role that Jews play in small town communities in supporting larger ecosystems of social support. Thanks. Yeah. So, so both Rabbi Isaacs and I have this, have this experience and I know that it's true for, for other communities in Maine as well, um, which is that often the most generous funders to our synagogues and our discretionary funds are also the most generous funders locally. Um, so it is our congregants that are giving to the United Way to support all of the work that they're doing, that are giving to the Boys and Girls Club, um, that are giving to the YMCAs to support all of the programs that they do with, uh, with children there. Um, so really we have, a, have an experience where our, our, our Jewish donors are incredibly generous, not only to our synagogues, but also to the broader Jewish community. And that we really rely on a small number of individuals um, to, to keep our synagogues uh, healthy financially, um, especially in the area of our discretionary funds and also really to keep the community um, community going. And those are families um, often that are from here whose children might still be here, but whose grandchildren might, might be moving away. And so there are some right questions and thoughts about what happens to the sustainability of this model um, as, these, as these families kind of leave. So that's a little bit about rural Jewish poverty in general, as Rabbi Isaacs and I have experienced it. Um, in our last five minutes or so, we want to talk about two more issues. And the first is the issue of uh, shame or status within the Jewish community. So um, I will just share that before I came to Augusta, I was a rabbi of a large congregation in Washington, DC. My discretionary fund went to support all sorts of wonderful national and organizations doing things. It did not ever go to individuals who were in need. And, um, and I, I did not really know Jewish people in my synagogue there who were in need of that money from that fund. And that is not true um, in my life here in Augusta. And, and there can be a lot of shame around poverty in the Jewish community um, and that lack of status is hard. So I will, I will just share one story, which is that I was on sabbatical last year and I had a member of the congregation who's very involved in congregational life, who I see almost on a weekly basis, who went to the minister who was overseeing my discretionary fund while I was gone several times to ask for help for food and rent assistance. And I do not think this person's financial situation changed drastically in the time I was gone. I just think that this person was embarrassed to ask me for help. Um, so I think that that shame that people have around needing help is very real. And it's very hard often for me to get people to take the money that I know that they need, that the synagogue has been able to provide for them. It often takes several con conversations um, and especially during COVID, I've been telling people more congregants have been giving because they know there's more of a need. So please take this because know that there's enough for everyone. 
um, and that helps people feel a little bit better. Um, I'll turn it back over to Rabbi Isaacs to share a little bit more about uh, shame and status around money in the community. So um, one of the elements that I want to talk about that I'll close with as, as a point is that part of returning dignity to those who are ashamed of their financial status, specifically within a Jewish context, is giving them the gift of Torah and Jewish community in a way that's structured, that when they approach us for programming, no matter how ambitious, um, that everybody feels as though they could participate in any program that we offer. So, you know, the most expensive event that I've ever run at my synagogue was a trip to Israel. And there had never been a mission to Israel from Beth Israel congregation until I came in as rabbi, even though the congregation was founded in 1902. And part of the reason that there was never a mission to Israel is because a huge percentage of the congregation couldn't afford to go. And we never really felt as though it was appropriate to run a trip when our most committed members couldn't attend along with us. And so unless we could raise enough funds that everybody could come, we weren't going to run the trip. And this runs in stark contrast when I have discussions of, uh, with colleagues in suburban and urban areas. When I tell this story, they say, that's funny, I never thought about who I was excluding uh, based on class from, a, from an Israel trip. It just never even occurred to me. And so whether it's through my individual synagogue or the Center for Small Town Jewish Life, we are thinking about socioeconomic equity from the very first moment we begin a program to the end because we don't want to compound the shame that Jews feel for not having enough money by excluding them from Jewish life. That might be the, the cruelest thing that we could do. And so we run our programs uh, at the Center for Small Town Jewish Life, you know, pay as you go, and everything is very bare bones, right? So we never serve meat. It's a small thing, but we never serve meat. And we always put scholarships in our budgeting before honoraria of high level speakers. And what we found is that, you know, we've got great rabbis in Maine that we've started spending less and less money on honoraria and more and more money on expanding access because that's actually what we value. And I'm just gonna tell two more stories that I think are important to tell in, an, in a national Jewish context. One is that, you know, I'm a conservative rabbi, Rabbi Ash is a reform rabbi. Um, denomination means very little in central Maine. We have more in common with each other than we do with uh, people in our denomination elsewhere. But there was a lot of interest when the USCJ and the RA had a large convention in Boston. Um, that was the closest major Jewish event that we had. Um, and so a few Jews from Maine asked for some kind of financial assistance um, to be able to attend because it was close by and travel costs were low. Um, and a lot of the people who wanted to go couldn't go because they didn't get the financial assistance they needed in order to attend. And I went there, you know, I could go because Colby was paying and, you know, there's this beautiful hotel with gorgeous catering right, and, and high level speakers that I know what they get paid in honoraria. And because I came as the only participant from Maine, what I saw were all the people who weren't there because they felt like they couldn't be there. And I wanna tell one other story related to that, which is that when I came in in my first year as a rabbi, Rabbi Ash's uh, predecessor, Rabbi Susan, who worked very closely with me as well, she said, I need to sort of instruct you in how to do this work. She said, don't send your kids to Camp Ramah. And I said, why? I want them to get that kind of education. And she said, never send Maine Jewish kids to a national Jewish summer camp because whenever I send my kids to national Jewish summer camps, they're shamed. Because even if they're individually wealthy, they don't know about the right clothes. They don't have the right equipment. And year after year after year, my kids come back when I want them to have these high level Jewish experiences, they come back and what they take away is I don't fit in because it's like a poor area in Maine. And so, you know, part of what we want to discuss is we in Maine have created a sort of independent Jewish ecosystem that's multi-generational and multi-denominational that's based on socioeconomic equity because our kids and our families really can't find a place or it's very difficult for them to find a place in the mainstream Jewish community either because they don't have the money 
or sometimes they individually have the money, but because they're part of an area of collective poverty, don't have the status or the cultural clues to know how to fit into wealthier Jewish communities um, from urban and suburban areas. So we, we can talk more about the center and our funding. I see questions are coming in, but I wanna hand it over to Leslie so she can talk a little bit about where we fit in in a national context. Thank you, Rabbi Isaac. So I want to um, I, I want to pull back and give a, a sense of the national context uh, for this. But first, I want to start with with a personal story of my own. I was 17 years old. It was Thanksgiving morning, my favorite holiday, and I come to the top of the stairs in my parents' home, starting to head down, and my father's coming back in the house in a coat and hat. I said, "Daddy, where were you?" He said, well, I'm going to tell you this and you can't tell anyone. He and his best friend had heard about a family in need, um, a father, a mother, and four children with no food in the house, none whatsoever. This man happened to be my art teacher. And my father and his friend took bags of groceries to the house, left them on the doorstep. And my father's message to me was, you never know who's poor and you never embarrass them by letting them know that you know that's Jewish giving. And that lesson has stayed with me. I grew up in a, in a very small Jewish community in Newport, Rhode Island. And I think the story illustrates a lot of, of what uh, Rabbi Ash and Rabbi Isaacs have been talking about um, in several ways. Um, first of all, in small Jewish communities, uh, especially in post-industrial ones, in Maine, uh, in say Northern Michigan, in the Rust Belt areas of Ohio and Pennsylvania and in the Southeast of the United States, where, these, there, where there were thriving Jewish communities, there are still Jewish communities. And um, they, we, we live side by side with non-Jewish uh, families and we have networks that we need to share uh, with each other and with the non-Jewish community. But let me, let me back out and explain to you what the network of independent communities is. The network of independent communities is, is uh, 300 or so very tiny towns, too small to be federations uh, that are part of the Jewish federations of North America, uh, but also compromise about 200,000 Jewish individuals and from whom the system raises, we raise almost $4 million that go to over, our overseas partners, the Jewish uh, uh, Agency and the Joint Distribution Committee. The people in those small towns who are giving dollars to go overseas are, as Rabbi Ash said, also the main supporters and stalwart uh, benefactors of their Jewish communities, mostly through their synagogues, because there is no Jewish family service. Uh, those of us, I, I, I I'm a past president of the Jewish Federation of Greater Metro West, the eighth largest uh, federation in the country. Uh, we have two Jewish family services. Uh, talk about an embarrassment of riches. It's not that there isn't Jewish poverty, but there's a structure in place that can help handle it. And the uh, Jewish Federations of North America is owned and made up of the federations. So there's no, there's no resource for Jewish poverty per se uh, at JFNA. Uh, the uh, Jewish network for the network for Jewish human services is, you know, very aware. Uh, I'm grateful for for the resources of their director, Ruben Rotman, who really helped educate me on the national picture for poverty and uh, especially the work of the Weinberg Foundation and the research that's being done. But missing in all of this still seems to be the different way in which small uh, Jewish communities function when United Way doesn't meet many of the needs of, of the congregants, when, um, when there is no Jewish family service, when there's no social service uh, professional to, to reach out for, except perhaps hundreds of miles away, or even several towns over, that's still hard for someone to access. So in all, for all of these reasons, JFNA is looking for models uh, to some extent, like the Center for Small Town Jewish Life, uh, and another model that we've seen in uh, Northeastern New York, which is actually also a network community, but a larger network community that does have its own JFS. And, and 
if we can find those models and use them as pilot programs, um, then we can seek uh, the funding to replicate them. And sometimes it's it really takes people working together. I think some of the models of, of what Northeastern New York did, um, things like um, increasing Wi-Fi access and, and um, getting iPads out to kids, getting them out to seniors, something we've done in, in our own community with Holocaust survivors. There are actually, there's an Israeli source for less expensive tablets that we could talk about um, that just keep people in line. Um, and where there is basic food insecurity, right, then then working in, in places where there is a Chabad, there's no, there's no room in small town Jewish life. I know this from my upbringing. There's no room for territorialism. You can't say, I'm gonna hold on to this because it's mine. I won't work with that. The old Jewish saying that there's two synagogues and I won't walk into either of them. That's, that does not exist in small town Jewish life. Everybody has to do everything and everybody has to get along because that's the way you preserve uh, Jewish life. Um, and, and Jewish tradition and, and really the, the basics of, of living. So, um, and, and, and the other thing is people, there's more transparency, right? So that's a good thing and a bad thing. We, in small towns, um, it's easy to know who to go to for help. On the other hand, uh, it, that, that issue of shame and not wanting people to know uh, it is very real in the Jewish community and frankly in the non-Jewish community. Um, you know, th this art teacher of mine that I talked about was from a well-to-do family and he didn't want his family to know and he didn't want to go to his church. So in the end, in that sense, the Jews took care of him. So I, I think that, that where I want to leave this is, is that as much as um, we care uh, that there not be, uh, and I, I visited these people myself, that there are poor, elderly poor in, uh, in six floor apartments in Odessa who need our help. And, and, we, and we respond to those people because they could easily be our grandparents or our great grandparents or, or us if, if, we, if our great grandparents hadn't had the ability to leave. So, should, so too do we have an obligation to take care of the poor and the food insecure and the cash insecure among us in, in these small town Jewish communities. All right, well, first of all, wow, thank you to each of you for this really powerful set of stories and observations. Um, first, Rabbi Isaacs and Rabbi Ash, just really highlighting the um, experiences from the front lines of this crisis um, and Leslie Rosenthal just sort of the national perspective. I think this is a really perfect microcosm of what the National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty is trying to do, which is bring sort of stories from the front line, stories from people who are um, working directly um, in communities um, into conversations with the more strategic, higher level um, sort of observations to, to see what we can learn from that. And so I'm very grateful for, for that. Um, and I do want to mention, um, because it hasn't yet come up and, and I, I can't resist, um, a congratulations to Rabbi Ash, um, who has been named the president-elect of the CC AR. Uh, for those who don't know, that is the Central Conference of American Rabbis. Um, she will be the fourth woman, if I'm not mistaken, um, and the youngest person ever to lead this professional organization. Um, and there are something like more than 2,000 uh, reform rabbis involved. It's, it's, quite, um, an, it's quite an honor. Uh, and so congratulations. We're, we're delighted to um, that your leadership um, that you've been experiencing um, on so many different levels uh, already um, is going to be brought to that stage um, and be able to influence um, uh, the whole sort of a, a much, much broader uh, set of set of voices and a set of conversations. So uh, thank you in advance for that. Um, you know, I, at this point, I just I want to take a moment just to acknowledge and bring in a little bit of the work of Jane Ginsburg, um, who is the president of JFS of Northeastern New York. Um, Leslie just mentioned uh, that a moment ago. Uh, but last fall, some of you may know this, many of you may know this, um, Jane created a session at the JFNA Fed Lab, um, which was a full day session after the virtual GA. Um, and Jane's session really did focus on what we were calling at the time small community success factors. So essentially, it's all well and good to hear about Boston and New York all the time, but like really, really, what's it like for, for all of the rest of us? Um, I grew up in the Midwest, so I did not grow up in a, in a large community myself. Uh, so I'm, although I live in Boston now, um, so I'm quite uh, personally, uh, 
sympathetic to to the to the to the experience. Uh, so, but I just want to bring in some of Jane's observations from that time. Um, there's a wonderful one pager that she wrote, which we can uh, give to folks. But but a couple thoughts. You know, one is, and these, this, some of this has already come up um, about the the idea of being a small community. It's great to be small. Everyone knows each other. It's much easier to you know agencies know each other. Territorialism is not an option, and all those sorts of things. Not, you know, no, very little room for duplication of services. Um, but at the same time, everyone knowing each other has a flip side, um, especially when it comes to stigma or identification of, um, and it, you know, sometimes people literally the last person they want to talk to is somebody they already know. They would love to go to a place where it's completely anonymous um, in these in these moments, especially people who are facing personal struggles and have, you know, a status in the community or a role in the community. It's very, it's very challenging. So I'm wondering if maybe um, we can just give a couple of, you know, observations about that and how do we deal with that and what are I can imagine a lot of unsuccessful ways to deal with it, but just to uphold that dignity um, and to erase that stigma where possible, but also just you know where it's not actually possible to erase what what that anonymity could look like um, or that that safe that safety could look like. So I think that was one set of things that really stuck with me. Um, you know, there was a second set of observations she had about awareness building and just sort of ongoing promoting in the local Jewish newspapers, synagogues, and partners, but throughout the broader community as well because it is so tightly so tightly linked um, and that those conversations really are ongoing and they are not it's not sort of a one time let's get an op-ed into the paper or a one time let's have a prayer breakfast it really is um, sort of a day-to-day month-by-month campaign uh, and and that really does sort of get to the measurement and evaluation piece of working closely in consultation to build programs um, that are much more about well, not only issues of sort of what, what you know, urgent and sudden financial insecurity, but also, you know, some of the more cyclical poverty. Uh, so if we could just take a moment, um, just talking a little bit about what are some of the places where you three feel like there are these differences and it's how you how you think successfully, what it takes successfully to overcome them. So I think that's one thing. And then the second thing I want to pick up on, just to put a marker on it, is, um, you know, Rachel, you had mentioned sort of the experience of a main kid going to uh, a sort of a national camp. And I would imagine that that's not only just for the kids, um, although it, it's certainly, you know, more potentially more, you know, salient there. But I'd love to also talk about that a little bit, which is, you know, what does the national community need to look like? How does the national community need to look and be? So it's not all about fixing that one kid and preparing that kid to go to that camp, but you know what is it that the full community needs to look like um, in order that that is not an experience of a child or an adult um, coming into the conversation? So sort of both of those flip sides, I'm wondering if um, someone wants to pick up either the first or the second, but maybe we can start with the first one. I just want to talk about one element vis-a-vis -vis shame. And I think that there are a variety of ways to address it, but one thing that I do want to draw attention to is that in response to Rabbi Susan's advice to me, um, what Rabbi Ash and I came together to do along with Melanie Weiss, um, who also works with us, is we created our own summer camp. Now, I don't think that that's really a systemic solution, but I will say something important about the program we created is that it costs $5 a day. So the reason that it costs $5 a day is because everybody should pay something because if you give out too many scholarships or too many things are free, then people get in, people don't want to accept that much aid. They don't want to feel like a charity case. And so you need to find a price point for the median of your community where everybody can give something, something equal, and then um, you don't need to constantly make accommodations because equity is built into the program to begin with. Now, part of what that means is that we make lunch for the kids with bread that we get from the outlet on Kennedy Memorial Drive and from, you know, the salvage warehouse. And we use the backyard of Rabbi Ash's synagogue. And, you know, we also apply for grants and receive funding from Colby parents and alumni that are invested in this program. So there, there, you do need to fundraise in order to make those things work. But also part of it is we don't try to make anything opulent. And everybody understands why that is without saying it. 
and everybody appreciates that. The idea that even the wealthier families need some sort of luxury to get six hours of Hebrew and Jewish programming, they don't. They're just appreciative that we're teaching their kids and that they're learning Hebrew. And they will gladly take the peanut butter and jelly that Mel and some Hillel kid made for them the night before. So I think it needs to be built in. It's not just about how to make people comfortable coming to you. It's also about how you build events and programs where people don't need to ask for scholarships to begin with. But I'll hand it over to uh, Leslie. So I actually, <clears throat> um, so I think pre pre packing all of all of these kinds of programs, no matter where you are, is, is really something that can be easily replicated. It's a mindset. It doesn't it doesn't cost any money. I want to talk um, actually about the second thing that Susan raised, which is uh, this idea of how we can make people uh, bring people in. And one of the um, one of the silver linings, to the extent that there is any, to this terrible pandemic, has been just this: this Zoom, this ability to bring people together. And so, while the network represents two hundred thousand people and raises uh, the the amount of money a, 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 a small intermediate federation raises, we don't know each other, we don't see each other. Very few of our our uh, donors or the people who live in the, these small communities are ever going to make it to Israel or make it to uh, our our partnership communities in, say, Tbilisi, Georgia. During the, the pandemic, we've actually done a week long, a three session or four session mission to Israel and a one day trip to Tbilisi. In addition, in, in, my, in prior years as chair of the network, it's been incredibly difficult to entice people to come to JFNA's General Assembly. They don't know anybody, we're not gonna know anyone, their problems aren't the same as ours. This year's virtual GA allowed over 75 network attendees to be there. And it's a feature that um, I've certainly suggested, and I think JFNA is well aware that across the country, we need the, the, the ability to gather virtually in some aspect of that programming is huge. I also wanna say that there's nothing like being in person. I don't want the discussion of poverty and, and difficulty um, of life in small town Jewish communities. To, to, and not remark on the fact that the richness of Jewish life that you find in small towns, the, the meaning that people take is so important. And having experienced myself a Shabbaton uh, for the Center for Small Town Jewish Life, I, I have not had that kind of feeling of being um, an integral part of a Jewish community, like as if I was back at my Camp Young Judea in Amherst, New Hampshire, as I had sitting in a classroom at Colby College uh, uh, on a Shabbat morning. And so Jewish life in all of these places is very different uh, than in our larger communities, but no less worthwhile and no less inspiring. So it's, it's, a, it's a dichotomy, right? Life is, life is difficult, but it has just as much, if not more so, the kind of Jewish uh, kavana and meaning. Um, thanks, Leslie. It was so it was so lovely to have you there with us. I see Rachel smiling. We're like so looking forward to getting together again. And I think I just want to say a brief word about both of these. Um, on the national level, I think, and I I live more in the reform world, so that's kind of my experience. But I do think that we have to do better um, in terms of including uh, Jewish leaders from smaller congregations in our national bodies. And I think that it is often not apparent to people the financial barrier that exists to being a member of a board, to going to a convention, to as, as Rabbi Isaacs talked about. So I think we just have to be more aware of that. I really see an openness and a willingness to hearing those voices um, and also in the rabbinic community to hearing voices of people who work in community work. Um, but it's it ch changes very slow. So I think we just need to continue to do that, continue to elevate the voices of, of people um, who are living in, in more rural areas. Um, in terms of dignity, I wanna say two quick things. One is somebody asked kind of a practical question. I think it's really important that the money in my discretionary fund isn't my money, right? It's, it's money that has been given, I've been entrusted with, right? So it's not, it's very important when I talk to people that it's not from me, it's from the community. And 
I have even told someone who didn't have heat in the middle of winter, who was using space heaters plugged in, which is not only like it's dangerous and not warm. I said, I cannot sleep at night because I'm worried about you. So will you please take this money so that I can sleep? And this person eventually said yes. So, right, it is just, it is so hard. And I don't know how many people on this call have been in the position of having to ask for, for something. It's, it might, if you don't have experience with that, I think you don't truly appreciate how difficult it is, right? And then the other thing I tell people is like, this is anonymous. I, this is not something I'm thinking about when I see you, right? This is like, you are the person who comes to tour study. You are the person who comes to services. You are the person who's cooking the matzo ball soup in the kitchen, lifting up all of the work that they're doing for the synagogue um, and saying, this is like a moment in time when I'm gonna do this thing. And then it's, it's right? It's kind of like the Catholic confessional booth, right? We don't remember what happens after we leave, after we leave the room. Um, and the final thing I'll say is that our synagogue moved to a, a, we call it a truma structure, a give what you can structure. We found that even though we would no questions ask, uh, give any sort of abatement, which is not true in some larger congregations, they're asking you for your tax returns and those sorts of things. Literally, you just had to call up Hildy and say, this is what I can pay. Even making that phone call was hard for people and it made people feel like what they were giving was less and wasn't as important, which is what Rabbi Isaac said about Funtensive. So we switched to a dues model that is literally a forum that says it costs this much to run the synagogue per unit. We know some people can pay more than this figure. We know some people can't. Pay whatever you can and we gratefully accept whatever you can give as a full member. So we have people who are members of our congregation who pay $18 a year, $36 a year and feel and are just as important as the person who can give $5,000 a year. And that has made a really huge difference, I think, in just how people feel about being a part of the community. Good, these are terrific observations. And I think we've actually worked in a number of the questions from the Q&A. We've got um, a handful in the Q&A and a handful in the chat. Um, just one I wanted to highlight, <clears throat> it was an interesting one. It said, um, you know, I've been on a lot of these uh, webinars or this is now I think the 10th in our series. Um, we're starting the new year, but it's, it's an ongoing series. Uh, but I think this may be the only one with two rabbis. Is there something about the role of clergy in a small community that's different and leads to a poverty alleviation role? And I think we addressed that briefly, um, but I just want to sort of tie in this last comment that you made because I really believe that there, actually both of you, uh, both Rabbi Asics and Rabbi Ash, you both said something um, about universal design. What does it mean to look like to design a system that doesn't require scholarships, that doesn't require someone to raise their hand and say, I need something special because everyone is sort of included from the outset. And it reminds me, if you haven't read, there's sort of a wonderful um, article by uh, Angela Glover Blackwell called The Curb Cut Effect, C-U-R-B-C-U-T. Um, and it was in the Stanford Social Innovation Review a couple of years ago, but it really beautifully illustrated this idea. She she's was the founder of PolicyLink um, of, you know, when, when you create curb cuts in the sidewalk, it not only helps people who use wheelchairs or want it, it helps people who are um, with strollers. It helps people who may be um, in a situation where they're rolling groceries. It helps travelers, business travelers who are rolling, you know, suitcases. Um, but the notion of saying like, what does it look like to design something for everyone? If you uh, if you take the ramp right the off of up, up up to a building and you shovel the snow and the ice off the ramp, everyone can use it. Whereas if you only shovel the stairs, some people can use it. So how do you really sort of from design um, from the outset build things um, that are include an, an encompassing of dignity so that you don't have to build it in later and make exceptions and and make people feel um, like they're not less than because they actually aren't. So I just really want to elevate those two examples. Examples. I think people talk about this a lot, but those are really two very powerful examples that um, probably that I, I haven't heard before, which I, I'm grateful for. And I just I really think that as as we think about some of the questions of what does it mean to be in a small town, I just wonder. I want to pick sort of pick this up and say like, is this just more front and center for you because of um, because of how the how small the community is? So maybe you can give us a little bit of a sense um, either on the rabbinic perspective or or just the design piece, but I think it's really helpful to hear um, like kind of these, these, you don't need to reduce access barriers because of how it's designed in the first place. Yeah, I, I love that you bring this up because I often say that small town Jewish life, uh, we're not the periphery, we're the frontier. 
I think that uh, the entire Jewish community should be looking to us because we're on the forefront, actually. We're not the ones being left behind. And issues around socioeconomic equity, especially post-COVID um, and the K-shaped you know, uh, recovery, right? This is gonna become more and more central, not just in post-industrial towns and geographically isolated communities, but more broadly throughout um, the Jewish community. So I think you know, one of the things that I found really interesting, we run a rabbinical school training program through the Center for Small Town Jewish Life. I just wanna offer two anecdotes from that. One of which is one of the rabbinical students that worked with me came from Westchester, which is not a small town Jewish community at all. But in her childhood, one of her parents had lost their job and went to the synagogue and asked for a dues abatement uh, so that the family could continue to be part of the synagogue and it was denied. Mm. And so part of the reason she applied to work with the Jewish community in Waterville is precisely because she was interested in a model of Jewish life that's sensitive to issues of class in a way that she hadn't experienced in a main, mainstream Jewish community. Um, the one other thing that I'll say is that we are also, again, we're not unique. There are Jews with fi financial need throughout the American Jewish community. They're just more visible and they're probably more involved because the barriers to entry are much lower here, um, is that we had another rabbinical student who came from a well-to-do family from a Chicago suburb that came to work for us uh, for a year in Waterville. And as part of his work, he worked with Mel, my wife, in making sandwiches for the local uh, sandwich program we have in Waterville. And Mel said, you know, usually we have to make 500 sandwiches, but we have to make 700 now because we were placed at the end of the month instead of the beginning of the month. And he looked at us totally honestly and he said, why do you need to make more sandwiches at the end of the month than you need to do at the beginning of the month? Because he didn't understand the way that SNAP benefits worked or the way that you know, federal assistance worked. Now, if he hadn't spent that year in Waterville, he would have gone into the rabbit not knowing the difference between the beginning of the month and the end of the month. So you know, I think this universal design stuff is important because I think that this poverty isn't just gonna be in post-industrial towns where it's collectively experienced, but you're gonna see more of it in suburban and urban Jewish communities. I also think that speaks to the, the question that was in the Q&A about what larger communities uh, rabbis can learn. Uh, so I also wanna um, actually acknowledge the work of the Jewish Community Legacy Project, which was, is a group that was started initially to help small congregations uh, um, close themselves with dignity and, and with a plan and is now actually engaging more in the work of helping these congregations continue to exist in ways that are meaningful while having a plan in their hip pocket. Um, at any rate, the, the, clerg the clergy in, these, in, in, in all of these towns wind up being the source because there is no other infrastructure. Even when there's infrastructure, what we are already seeing, I believe, is since the pandemic uh, and, and the growing uh, uh, gap between the poor and the wealthy is rabbis at all, in all so city sizes being the first line of approach. Um, and it, I think it's more important uh, in the larger communities to teach people how, how to run those networks so that there isn't duplication of effort that happens, the, the lack of duplication that happens naturally in a small town. Um, you know, when you think about all of the different places someone in need could go in my community uh, alone, uh, you could go to JFS, you could go to the uh, Hebrew free loan, you can go to the rabbi, you can go, you know, try and access government programs, all of those things that, that once again, this is where the small communities can be a model for the larger communities of making sure. Um, and I, I would urge everyone to take a look if, if we can send it out to people, the small community success factors apply equally in large communities if people are willing to let go, share their resources and share their brain power. So we have about five minutes left of this discussion and then I'll give everyone a chance to um, have a parting thought. But are there other questions, there are a number of questions in the Q&A um, that I want to see if there were some responses to. Let me just read out the questions and you can um, pick what you would like to respond. I mean, what, they can be combined. Um, there was a question about whether there's a for, any form of Hebrew free loan society in Maine or are you guys it? Um, I think you guys are it, okay. Um, 
from your experiences, and this we talked about this uh, about how to prevent this, but once it's a, a factor, um, what are your experiences um, about the barriers to access of, around shame, and how do you deal with the inability to ask for help? Um, especially because of shame and embarrassment and admitting needs. So I think we talked about how to prevent it in the first place, which I think was powerful, but what, can you talk a little bit about what it means to, once it's there, um, different ways to, to address it? And again, Rabbi Ash, you mentioned sort of just changing the dude's structure entirely. And so that's a great example. Are there others, um, others that you wanna bring into the conversation? I mean, I think that we are very conscious of, and I think many synagogues do this, of not only recognizing people who give financially, but people who give of their time, right? People who get financial help from us are often people who give the most of their time um, to the congregation. So I think that, you know, both of those are things that make small communities run. It's me and a 20 hour a week administrator who mainly does our finances. But like we need people to get there early to set up chairs and to help cook our um, holiday meals and to do the posters that we do for right all of that and to like run our Zoom rooms. And so we don't just like we don't make it without the people who write checks to us. We also don't make it without the people who give up their time. So we're just very conscious of valuing both of those things and not making it seem that giving up your time is somehow less than writing a check. Um, and I think that that helps restore dignity to people when they see their name in the newsletter. Thank you so much to these volunteers who made our Hanukkah celebrations possible, right? In addition to the name of people who have given money. Um, and I think the other thing is that we as a community have a culture where we really value that. It's not just lip service. Like congregants recognize and appreciate the people who are putting in the time. And that's a really important, important thing as well. Good. I think you mentioned something a little bit earlier, which also struck me about, you know, in it, it was a very, it was a, a, a line in passing, but uh, Eric, what you said, um, I think it's, it's very different if you've never experienced it, right? And so what does it mean to bring people who have experienced some of these issues firsthand, help, potentially in a volunteer way, but also just in a, in, a, in a firsthand experience way, what does it mean to bring them into the design process so that it really does feel like one community as opposed to we are giving to you or I am receiving from you um, but it's really one, one full community where everyone has a role to play and that authenticity, people feel when it's not authentic pretty quickly. Um, and so just how to build that authenticity of, of one community from the outset, I think it was really powerful um, as well. Any other observations on this? Because otherwise we can kind of transition to, to last thoughts. I'll just share very briefly on that point, right? So part of being a rabbi in a small congregation is that I also don't get paid the same way that my rabbi, my rabbi colleagues in larger congregations do, right? Now there's a lot of benefits that I feel like I personally get. Um, one is that my congregation wants me to have a life and to enjoy living in Maine and to spend time with my family and my children and they value that in a very deep way. But what it also means on the flip side is that I don't, my dues are not paid to the organization of which I am going to become vice uh, president elect are not paid by my congregation. They're paid out of pocket by me and I get a dues reduction from my professional organization. So I have the experience, I think that I would not have if I was a rabbi in a large congregation of actually asking for an abatement. And one of the things that I found with my colleagues is that it's really frustrating to ask every year to be like, yep, still in the same job. Yep, still not getting my things paid. So the CCAR to his great credit, our, our uh, dues chair Peter Stein said, great, if you're in a situation where you know you're going to need dues reduction for a long time, just put that in a note to me and I'm not going to ask you every year. You can just put in your amount and we'll be good. And that makes a huge difference for people. And I wouldn't have realized that, how it was impacting my colleagues who are serving in smaller congregations or in community-based settings if I didn't experience it. So I think that these personal experiences, and this will be my closing thought, I think that these personal experiences can also not only um, help us when we're in our communities, but also help us really think about national um, Jewish organizations and those very small steps that seem small that we can do that really make a huge difference in valuing and honoring every person as a full member of our community. Good. Um, Thank you. That was a terrific closing reflection. Leslie, can we go to you? And then um, Rachel will give you the last word. 
Sure. Um, I think that uh, that Rabbi Asher really um, hit the nail on the head, as it were, because again, um, I've been raised and trained in the federation system as well as in in uh, the world of synagogues. And the thing that we're taught always is the basic, most basic Jewish value is that of B'Tselem Elohim, that each person is made in the image of God. And I think that we sometimes concern ourselves so much with the, with the faces, with the people whose faces we may never know in terms of ensuring their, that they are fed and kept whole and kept safe, that uh, it really behooves us in this day and age, as we look at a K-shaped recovery, as we look at all of the issues of poverty that are facing Jews in a way that perhaps has not happened uh, in the history of Jews in the United States, uh, re at least recently, that we keep those basic values in mind for the faces of the people we do know. So I'll, I'll just conclude, um, you know, I'm proud of what we've done in Maine. Um, but it is not a systemic solution. And it's made possible um, through a number of people, but mostly through the investment of one family um, that, that doesn't generally like a lot of attention. Um, that is a found that, that built my synagogue. Um, and they just happen for moral and emotional reasons to still be committed to Waterville, Maine and to the state of Maine. But it's an open question whether or not their children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren will share that commitment. And when that family, when they feel more committed to their apartments in Manhattan than they do to where their grandparents created their wealth in central Maine, there's a chance that the vibrancy of Jewish life and support for Jewish communities could really dissipate almost completely if our synagogues are eliminated or institutions like the Center for Small Town Jewish Life aren't supported by these families in the same way. We do, there is not a national infrastructure to help Jews in communities like ours. And I was very inspired by the Jews of Color uh, initiative that they had a COVID-19 relief fund specifically for um, a demographic that's often overlooked and misunderstood. I think that the national Jewish community needs to engage with this element of diversity, equity, and inclusion as well as part of the national Jewish mosaic, understanding our particular needs both emotional and financial. Um, and there needs to be a national solution as we look forward to the concentration of wealth in fewer and fewer American cities moving forward. So I'm really grateful to all of you for learning more about communities like ours and to the Jewish Funders Network for beginning a conversation about a demographic that I think uh, physically and mentally is too often left on the sidelines of major policy decisions for the American Jewish future. Well, thank you so much. Um, as suspected, um, this is the perfect antidote to yesterday's events um, and just really building up uh, community and really thinking about including everyone, literally everyone um, in community from the outset. So thanks to all three of you for the work you're doing and for being here today. Let me hand it back to Tamar to, uh, to bring us out. Thank you, Susan. I just want to echo the appreciation and gratitude for your time um, and learning with us and all that you do for you your communities and the larger Jewish communities. Um, and thank you everybody that participated uh, in this webinar. We look forward to seeing you all again soon. We have, a lot, like I mentioned at the start, we have a lot of learning opportunities and networking opportunities going, going on in the coming months. So please reach out if you want more information and look on our website and look at the newsletter. And we hope, um, we hope to see you again soon and stay well. Thank you again.